Take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We are continuing our journey through the book of Acts. The first five or six chapters of Acts, I'm looking at it as a series called The Body and what happens with the body of the church. Because within the first five, six chapters of Acts, we see that the, the church is built. We see the church is persecuted. We see the church is starting to grow. And we see the foundations that God is laying for the future growth of the church. And that brings us here to Acts 4. Our focal point is going to be verses 1 through 22. But there's one verse in here that sums up not just what Peter and John were doing, but it sums up the mission of the church, and it sums up what we should be proclaiming each and every day. That's Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Father, these are your words. Holy Spirit, you commissioned Luke to write them. You have preserved them. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you teach us today about the boldness that we need to stand before a world that denies you. Father, use Peter and John to embolden us today. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, as we think about the early church, we must remember that the early church had none of the advantages that we look at today. They didn't have any big budgets. They didn't have wealthy donors. Their pastors lacked credentials from accepted schools. They did not have the endorsements of the influential political leaders of their days. Most of their ministers had jail records and would probably have a hard time today joining our churches, let alone leading them. What really was the secret of their success? And I love what Warren Wearsby says about this. This is what he says. The Christians of the early church knew how to pray so that God's hand could work in mighty power. When asked to explain the secret of his remarkable ministry, the noted British preacher Charles Hatton Spurgeon replied, My people pray for me. St. Augustine said, Pray as though everything depended upon God and work as though everything depended upon you. Prayer is not an escape from responsibility. It is our response to God's ability. True prayer energizes us for service and battle. The early church was steeped in prayer, and that prayer emboldened them. And we will see today how that prayer emboldened Peter and John as they stood there before the bullies of the council. We also have to remember that something else very special is happening here. It's the beginning of the church persecution. You see, John MacArthur, as he's writing about this chapter, he says this, For the first 300 years of his existence, the church was merciless, persecuted by Rome. Torture, being burned alive, thrown to wild animals were common, and the Christians went to their deaths in a calmness that made their tormentors uneasy. Far from destroying the church, however, persecution merely served to purify and strengthen it. It matures the church the way trials mature believers. After surviving three centuries of violent attacks, the church emerged as the dominant force in the Roman Empire. In the words of the church father Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And this is what Acts chapter 4 brings us to. It brings us to the beginning of this church conflict. And why did this conflict come about? It came about because of the announced truth that Peter and John had the audacity to say there in the temple. What did they say? 
Silver and gold I have none, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. They preached and proclaimed Jesus Christ. Church, we have to understand this. The truth will always bring conflict. Always. But there is power in the truth and that there is boldness in the truth. See, verses 1 through 4 shows us that the truth will bring conflict. What does it say there? While they were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed at their teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and took them into custody until the next day since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Well, who confronted Peter and John? Luke tells us right here, there were the priest. Now, as we talk about the priest, we must remember that these are just the ordinary priest. We have to go all the way back to Leviticus to see about the rotation that was set up for the priestly service that was there. These priests would wait until their lot was called. Then they could come into the temple. And then when they were there, then they would rotate through the sacrifices. The priests that confronted Peter and John were the ones that were there to do the evening sacrifice. And their time of service had been interrupted by them. And they would not get a chance for about another two years to come and to do this. So they were annoyed that their time of service had been interrupted. But notice, there was also the captain of the temple police. This is a very important figure there. As I was studying this, I didn't realize how important of a figure this man was. This man was second only to the high priest. This man, he had a duty not only from the council, but from the Roman government as well to keep charge and to keep order within the temple complex. See, if they didn't keep order, then the Romans could come in and take care of it. And nobody wanted that. Because when the Romans came in and took care of it, they took care of it. Then there were the Sadducees. See, the Sadducees were one of the four sects of Judaism in the first century. Now, with the Sadducees, they were political, they were wealthy, and they were opposed to anything that opposed Rome since it would harm their interest. I love what John MacArthur says about this. And, and let me just say this. There is a lot of parallels between the Sadducees in that day to some of the theological liberalism we see today. And this is why. See, their religion was one largely a social custom. They believed only in the written law, rejecting the oral traditions. And that was important because the Pharisees, not only did the Pharisees believe in the written law, but they also accepted those oral traditions, those things that had been passed down. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the body or in any future rewards or punishments. What you see is what you get. It's right now. They rejected predestination and the sovereignty of God, believing man to be the master of his own destiny. They believed that you knew how to run your life better than God. They didn't believe in a God that, that had things laid out. They believed in a God, and, and to be honest, there are some theological liberals today that believe this, that God has just wound things up and let them go, and just watching and not doing a thing. That's not what God does. God has his hands upon us. God is working within us. He is working through us. He is talking to us 
through his infallible, inerrant word. We listen to him through prayer and the Holy Spirit that indwells us because of the cross and what Jesus has done for us. The cross has predestined something for every single person in human history. It is predestined one of two things. It is predestined a glory land and a promised hope for those that embrace the cross and the forgiveness that's there. And it is also promised eternal condemnation for those who turn their back upon the gift of Jesus at the cross. Sadducees didn't believe that. But my friends, that's what the word of God says. See, I want you to understand this. And this may step on some toes, and if it does, if you got some weak toes, curl them up. The first attack on the church did not occur from the enemies outside the church. It came from the religious leaders and those that said that they were appointed by God. It occurred from those liberals within the Judaistic faith because they saw themselves as more important than what God says. Be aware. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it because I am telling you, even here in Danville, this day, there are people in pulpits across this city that do not believe that this is the word of God. Know what you believe, know why you believe it. Because one day God is going to call you to stand up for it. And why did they confront them? They were annoyed. In, in some translations, they used the word grieved. And I love what Albert Barnes said about this. He said, this word thus translated occurs in only one other place in the New Testament, in Acts 16, 18. It implies more than simple sorrow. It is a mingled emotion of indignation and anger. They did not grieve because they thought it a public calamity, but because it interfered with their authority and opposed their doctrine, it means that it was painful to them or they could not bear it. It is often the case that bigots and men in authority have this kind of grief at the zeal of men in spreading the truth and thus undermining their influence and authority. Here were these two men undermining their authority by what they were preaching. The truth will bring us into conflict. And why were they annoyed at their teaching? Because these men, they were from Galilee. You see, they were from the wrong side of the tracks. They didn't have an education. They were not connected to any priestly office, and they were certainly not authorized by the council to be teachers. Because you see, the Sadducees, the priest, they thought they were the ones that could regulate the truth and tell who could preach what. And what were they preaching? See, they were annoyed at what they were proclaiming. 
they were proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Why would they be annoyed at that? Well, first, they rejected the idea of a resurrection. Just a few weeks ago, they got rid of Jesus. They thought they had put everything to bed. But now, if they accepted Jesus as having risen from the dead, the people would see them as heretics. And they would lose their authority. And they couldn't have that. I said, what did they do? They arrested Peter and John. Yeah, and here's an irony in here. Just a few weeks before they arrested Jesus at night, just as they arrested Peter and John, and what do they do? Peter and John, they stuck him in jail because hey, it's illegal to have a night trial. And yet, just a few weeks before, what had they done? They had illegally convicted Jesus Christ for being who he said he was. I want you to understand this. Whenever we speak truth, the truth will bring opposition, the truth will bring division, and the truth will bring upheaval. Because there are those who will not want to hear it, no matter what. Truth is hurtful. When I was teaching, we would send out progress reports every so often. And one of the ways that I would entice my children to bring them back was I would offer them a hundred as a quiz grade to return it signed. You know, that way I, I get a signature on that, and mommy or daddy was supposed to have looked at it. I kept all of those, because you can never tell when something was going to happen. Well, one day, this little girl who was not doing well in my class at all, a couple progress reports had gone home, and she had rose her grade from a low F to a medium F. And mom came out and boy was she mad at me. Why in the world is my little angel doing so bad in your class? Well, we were sitting there with a the guidance counselor and I had my paperwork. And I said, look, I don't understand because at this date this went home and your little angel had this grade. You signed here saying that you saw it. Three weeks later, your little angel, your grades come up, I'll, I'll give her that. It's still not good. You signed here saying you saw it. Why are you upset? Because, and she told me, just because I signed it doesn't mean I read it. And I'm like, you try that in court. My friends, just as she was unwilling to see the grades on there and to accept responsibility for her little angel, there are those that will take a look at what the Word of God says and turn their back on it because they don't want to come to grips with what God says about them. And what does God say about them? Same thing God says about us, that we are sinners who are on the road to death who need a savior and Jesus came and took our penalty for us yet there are those that will not want to hear that but when the truth goes out another thing happens not only will, will there will be those that not want to hear it but there will be those that will hear it and will be pricked and they will convert because the truth will bring about conversion notice what it says here that there were some 5,000 men we don't know the full number. We don't know how many women were there. We don't know how many children were there that heard. But we know that at least 
thousand people came to accept Jesus Christ because of what Peter and John did and proclaimed. When the truth goes out, those that are seeking will find it and they will embrace it. What does that mean for us, church? We speak the truth. We need to speak the truth no matter what. Because we know there's some that's going to turn their back on it, but we also know that there's some that are going to hear it and that they are going to respond positively to it. Now we know that the truth will bring conflict, but also in verses 5 through 12 we see that there is power in the truth. I'm not going to read that whole section of scripture, but there's some, several things in there that, that really are important to understand. It starts out with this assembly that goes on. And in that assembly, it's very important to understand who's there. It says, the rulers. And who are the rulers? Those were the chief priests, the ones that were there that were supposed to be in the temple doing the sacrifices. They were there in that assembly. The elders, these were the heads of the families and the tribes. They were there. The scribes, these were the law experts, the Pharisees, they were there. It says, Annas, the high priest. Now here we have to stop for a little bit. You see, Annas, when it says he's the high priest, he was not really the high priest. See, the Romans removed Annas as the high priest in order for Caiaphas. But Annas was the power broker. He was the man behind there who made everything move. He was there. Anybody who was anybody was there. You know, in, in a few weeks, we've got the run for the roses coming up. I gave up looking at that horse race years ago. But do you know what happens? It's like all the state of Kentucky and everybody that is somebody shows up at that track. Either they're showing off their horses or they're showing off their hats, but they are there to see what's going on. That's kind of like what was going on here. All these people showed up to see what was going on. And here in the midst of all of it, who do we have? Peter and John, two Galilean fishermen. See, they were standing there in the same place that just a few weeks ago their friend Jesus has stood. Looking at perhaps many of the same faces that Jesus looked at. And they're looking at this crowd, and this crowd is looking back at them, and I can imagine the looks that they see. <laughs> they're seeing these men looking back at them and thinking, we took care of this a few weeks ago. Why are we back here doing the same thing? There's an important truth that is right here. Is that no matter how much we try to suppress the message of Jesus, that message will always touch and change people. Have you ever tried to squish Plato? You know, you try to squish Plato, and what's it going to do? It's going to run out your hands. It's going to run all over the place. It finds those cracks and it goes. That's what it does. Every time they tried to squish the, the truth of Jesus and who he is, what happened? The truth made its way out. And then they asked the question. The question was simply, what authority do you have? By what power or in what name have you done this? That was the question, but the real question behind it is this. Why are you talking about Jesus? Why are you talking about him? We had him killed a few weeks ago. Why are you doing this? 
Why are you causing this upheaval? And as they were talking about this, the one thing that they could not call into question was the miracle that had happened. The miracle of that lame man who got up after 40 years of being unable to walk, he got up and he danced into the temple. They could not deny the power of God that was there. They knew the authority. But they were asking, why are you doing this? Why are you challenging this? Why do you want to bring Rome down upon us? And notice Peter's answer. You know, we see a big change in Peter here. In the gospel, I refer to Peter as the, as the disciple with athlete's mouth. Because every time he opens his mouth, he says something that is just wrong. But here we see a boldness that has come upon him because he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. And he stands there in front of all these people who had condemned his friend, his Savior, just a few weeks before. And he says this, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man by what means he was healed, let it be known to, you, to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you you help thee. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Look at what Peter did here, and there's things that we need to learn. He recounted what happened, that a lame man had been healed by the power of Jesus Christ. This answered the, the question of the power and the authority. But he goes on further. He points to them and says, you put him to death. And no one there could deny that because they had been sitting there just a few weeks before and voted to kill him. They remembered what occurred. And Peter is reminding them of that. And then he goes on to say, and God rose Jesus from the dead against all of what the Sadducees believed. Yet here's the truth. There are many reputable witnesses to this. Go back and look at 1 Corinthians 15. And when you get toward the end of that chapter, Paul states that there were over, at that time, 500 people still alive who could attest to that fact. Just because somebody doesn't believe the truth does not make the truth a lie. The truth will always be the truth. We can't change it. My friends, let's look at what this world is doing today. This world is saying, I lost count of how many genders they say there is. You know, you add another day to the calendar, I'm sure they're coming up with another gender. But let's go back to the Bible. God created them male and female. You see, if you can take out Genesis 1, you can take out the need for John 3.16. And all of this mess that the world is going through by trying to get us to reject truth is to get us to reject the need for a Savior. Because if we didn't fall, what in the world is there for us to be saved from? See, the truth will always bring us into conflict with those who reject the truth. 
And why do people reject the truth? Because people do not want to be held accountable for their actions. That's why in verses 13 through 22 that Peter and John could stand there in boldness because of the truth. Listen to what the word says. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, and they said nothing to say in opposition, after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so this does not spread any further among the people. Let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than, than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because all the people were giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. As they were standing there, these, these bullies that Peter and John were in front of, they were bewildered. See, here were Peter and John, these were uneducated, untrained fishermen from the wrong side of the track. And they are not backing down to the threats that are coming down. And these men in the Sanhedrin, they were amazed and they were perplexed by the poise that was there in front of them. These two men who should have crumbled upon the weight of the authority that was there, they were standing firm and pointing their fingers back at him and says, I will obey God rather than you. And as these bullies were looking on, they also saw the healed man. See, this man is a testimony to the miracle that had occurred. And no one could deny that it had taken place. It was a lot like Lazarus. You know, there was no denying that Lazarus was dead. He'd been in that grave for four days. When Jesus said, come out. And he walked out of that grave. And there was silence there. You know, at my home, silence isn't always golden. And there's a lot of times when there is silence and you wonder what is taking place. What is somebody into? What is being broken? What is happening? Now, I imagine that was the case here. There was silence in this chamber. And that silence to this council had to be unnerving. Because there's no way they could deny what had happened. There standing in front of them was a man who for 40 years had not been able to walk. He was standing there in his own power because of what Jesus had done. See, and if they affirmed that the miracle had taken place, then they would turn out to be hypocrites. Because they have said all along that God does not involve himself in the affairs of man. So they're asking the question, how do we deny what has happened while keeping the peace? How? And there in that conference, there was the truth displayed. As they were there looking over it, they understood that God at work. You know, as we look through the course of the Bible, we see that over and over again. How about Noah's neighbors? They saw the boat, they heard the message of Noah, and yet his neighbors drowned in the water. What about what happened at Mount Carmel? At Mount Carmel, they saw the altar of Elijah that was engulfed by fire from the heavens. How about the Exodus when they saw the Red Sea split open? 
How about the manna that was given every day? And yet, when all this happened, when the, the first time they came to the border of the promised land, they did not trust God to go in and possess the land. You see, even today, there is evidence of a creator all over the place. Look at your finger. Your fingertip is evidence of a creator. And yet people still want to deny God's existence. And so what do they do? They, they threaten the truth. Don't speak in his name. Here, after only a few weeks after the resurrection, the church is at an incredible crossroads. And I want you to understand that the decision that Peter and John make right here would affect world history. It would affect you and me. And these two men, they had no idea about the role they were about ready to play. But they responded in obedience. When we are obedient to the truth, it will always bring us into conflict with the world. Obedience to the truth will always bring us into conflict with the world. And what did they say? The council said, no, Jesus. Don't speak about him. Don't teach in his name anymore. And why is that? In my library, I, I got a little book called Fatal Flaws. And in that, it's talking about evolution. And they have a quote by Aldous Huxley. He was a noted evolutionist and pacifist. And he wrote that evolution pictured a world that was meaningless. And he was okay with that. Why? Because meaning, because meaning brings morality. He wrote this. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. If we have meaning, that means there must be boundaries. And there are those that would rather have no meaning and no boundaries. God gives us boundaries not as a way to cut down on fun, but he gives us boundaries as a way to protect us. You see, we do away with Jesus. We do away with morality. We do away with morality. Then we make man the judge of what's right and wrong. You see, and that is what the Sadducees believed, that man oversaw his destiny, not God. My friends, we see that playing out again today. And what did Peter and John say? Nope, not going to do that. You decide if it's right or wrong. I know what I'm going to do. I am going to talk about Jesus. I am going to preach Jesus. I'm going to tell what Jesus has done. And the truth was glorified. We are proof today of that truth. See, we would not be here today worshiping here at Woodlawn if Peter and John had kept silent. They followed God. And because of their obedience, the world was changed. They understood the need to talk about who Jesus is. And as they did that, they turned the world upside down. Uneducated fishermen from the wrong side of the track changed the world. My friends, my family, God has given us a message. And that message very simply is, no Jesus and no peace. Or you can know Jesus, K N O W, and no peace, K N O W. 
And our message as Christians is simply this. To take the name of Jesus with you. So that the child of sorrow and woe can see hope. Not in the world, but in a Savior. How about let's do that this week? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we just want to say thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for the boldness of Peter and John. Lord, that they could stand there in boldness before these bullies. And Lord, that they, Lord, that they proclaimed the name of Jesus to a world that didn't want to hear it. And because of their obedience, the world was turned upside down. Father, give us the opportunities to proclaim Jesus so that we can turn our world upside down. In your name we pray, amen.